and he will be introduced by Father Carlos del Rosario. Father Caloy. Good morning, Your Excellency. Good morning. Our resource speaker is a Filipino-American molecular biologist and a Dominican priest. He was born on November 1, 1968 in the Philippines and then immigrated to the U.S. He attended the University of Pennsylvania where he earned a Bachelor of Science Engineering summa cum laude in 1989. In 1997, after a brief fellowship at the Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research at the University College of London, he entered the Order of Friars <laughs> Preachers and was ordained a priest for the province of St. Joseph in the United States. He has two doctorates, one in molecular biology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and one in moral theology from the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. He is an associate professor of biology and professor of theology at Providence College, Rhode Island. He is also the founder and chief researcher at the Osteatico Laboratory. Majority of his work focuses on the development of stem cells, cell apoptosis, and the role of science in religions. Father Osteatico is currently a visiting professor of biological sciences at the University of Santo Tomas, Manila. In last year, 2020, Father Nicanor has started to bring his molecular biology expertise into the fight against COVID-19 with a project on yeast-based oral vaccine for Filipinos. As a fellow of the OCTA research team, he is very much involved in pandemic management for the Philippines. Let us all welcome Reverend Father Nicanor of Seaco OP. Good morning, uh, Excellencies from the United States. I actually arrived here just two nights ago. I will be here for one month uh, working in my laboratory before I return to the Philippines. So uh, can, can I either share my screen or let me see if I can, or have my screen shared? Let me see, very good. So, so, I have prepared a 10 minute presentation on the science and ethics of the COVID-19 vaccines. At this, after the presentation, I will be very happy uh, to answer any questions you may have on the COVID-19 vaccines or on COVID-19 as an infection uh, with a special emphasis in the Philippines. So my presentation is going to be divided into three parts. First, I would like to, to uh, inform you on how the COVID-19 vaccines actually work because it's really important that you understand why vaccines do what they do. We will then discuss the COVID-19 vaccines that will be available in the Philippines, both uh, with a special emphasis on the moral dimension, <coughs> the moral dimension of some of these vaccines. I will then conclude with a discussion of a timeline for the COVID-19 vaccine arrival in the country. I currently serve on two vaccine procurement and deployment task forces, one for, the, for Quezon City, the largest city in the country, and second for the city of Las Piñas, where my mother actually works. So hopefully I will be able to help you to understand the challenges and struggles that we will have over the next year as we attempt to vaccinate the Filipino people. So this is an image of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that is responsible for COVID-19. And I show it to you because we are going to refer back to this picture uh, several times during this presentation. So we'll begin by talking about the COVID-19 vaccines and how they work. So the key take home message here is that antibodies destroy SARS-CoV-2. And the reason why the pandemic has been so uh, devastating around the world. So as of yesterday, 100 million people have been uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2 in, in less than a year. 
Uh, and the reason why we are so vulnerable to COVID-19 is because no one has any antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And so the goal of the vaccines is to help our bodies to make these antibodies that will destroy SARS-CoV-2. And this is a picture, uh, a very famous picture. This is Helen Keenan. She is 91 years old and she's the first person to be vaccinated against uh, COVID-19 in the UK. Uh, she was vaccinated uh, in the middle of December. And what people may not realize is that the nurse who vaccinated her is actually a Filipina who had been serving at the National Health Service of the United Kingdom for 25 years. So returning back now to the picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, what I would like to point out to you, and it's encircled in red, is um, what is called the spike protein. And the spike protein is a bump on the surface of the virus. So if you took your hand and you touch the skin of the virus, what you would see on the surface of the virus is about 75 of these spike proteins. And the spike protein is used by the virus as a key to enter each one of our cells. It is also the part of the virus that is being used to generate the vaccines that we are currently deploying around the world. And so there are several kinds of vaccines that are being deployed, but the major idea behind these vaccines is we take the spike protein that covers the surface of the virus and we inject that into your body or we inject the information that will allow your body to make just that protein. So there is no living virus that is injected directly into you. Um, if they do that, and the Chinese vaccines have that approach, the virus has been killed before it is injected into your body. So which vaccines will be available in the Philippines? I would like to begin by just pointing out a very important ethical consideration. So this is a picture of HEC 293 cells. And these are the cells that were obtained from the remains of an aborted female fetus in 1972 in the Netherlands. So these are the cells that remain. So there's, there is no part of the fetal body other than cells that were descended from um, fragments of this uh, child's kidneys. And what is important to know is that some of the vaccines were made using these cells. And I wanted you to see the cells because so many people imagine that what you are dealing with here are parts, uh, visible parts of a fetal body. And some people I know have asked me whether or not there are baby parts actually inside the virus. And one of the things I want to show you is that these are the cells that were used to make the vaccine, but none of these cells are actually injected into you. They were used during manufacture, but they are destroyed uh, in the process of making the vaccine. And I'm going to indicate vaccines that were made with these aborted cell lines, these aborted cells with this icon, this orange icon of an unborn baby human fetus. Now, uh, in terms of the church's uh, teaching on this, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith released a note on December 21st, and I am quoting this text here for your reference. Um, and basically what the most important part is the part in red. So the Holy See has said the following, it must therefore be considered that in such a case, all vaccinations recognized as clinically safe and effective can be used in good conscience with a certain knowledge that the use of such vac vaccines does not constitute formal cooperation with the abortion from which the cells used in the production of the vaccines derives. So I would, I'm going to simply end here and I can discuss this 
document from the CDF with you further during the question and answer session. However, when I teach this in my class, so I am a moral theologian, so I teach classes in moral theology. Um, when people talk about formal cooperation or formal appropriation uh, with evil acts in the past, I point out that Roman roads were constructed by slaves many thousands of years ago. And I asked the question, may a virtuous tourist, may a Catholic bishop walk on these roads that were constructed by slaves 2000 years ago without implicating themselves in slavery? And we understand today that because the event happened 2000 years ago and that, that we are morally distant from the slavery that was used to construct these roads. And so we do not have moral problems with Catholic bishops or Catholic people walking on the streets of Rome. It would be different if our walking on these streets led to future acts of slavery. And so what the church has determined and moral theologians are in agreement is that because the abortion happened in the past and the use of uh, vaccines for reasons I can explain during the question and answer will not lead to future abortions, then we may avail ourselves of these vaccines for grave reasons, uh, including and especially ending the pandemic in the same way that we can walk on Roman roads that were constructed by slaves uh, thousands of years ago. So returning now to the vaccines for the Philippines, this is a map that I obtained online that will identify the vaccines that we are expected to receive in the Philippines. I'm going to divide them into three categories. So the first category are the vaccines we will expect to receive from the West. So correct, right now we have Moderna and Pfizer and AstraZeneca. So these are the three vaccines, more about them shortly, but these are the three vaccines that have currently been approved for distribution around the world from the West. We also have the Gamalaya vaccine from Russia. And then we have two vaccines that have been approved by different countries, Sinovac and Sinopharm from China. So these are the major categories and I would like to go over each one of them now. So these are, a, this is a chart to compare the different vaccines. Uh, these are the, the vaccines produced in the West and the following slide will add the information from the Chinese vaccines. So what you will see here are the first two that were approved were Moderna and Pfizer. They're about 95% effective uh, and they have to be given in two doses separated by either three weeks or four weeks. Now the challenge of these vaccines in the Philippines is especially that the Pfizer vaccine must be transported and stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius. This is colder than the temperature in Antarctica. And so in the Philippines, we do not have sufficient freezers and refrigerators to store these vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine. Now Moderna vaccine can be kept in a regular freezer for ice cream or for frozen meat for uh, up to six months. Uh, we then have the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Russian Gamalaya. Both of these can be kept at regular fridge temperatures, but both of these were made using uh, fetal cell lines from the, aborted, from the abortion in 1972. With regards to uh, effectiveness or efficacy, you can see that Moderna, Pfizer, and the J Russian vaccines are relatively good. The AstraZeneca ranges from 60 to 90%. The standard approved protocols in the United Kingdom is 62%. That is what we would be expected to use here in the Philippines. With regards to the Chinese vaccines, um, neither of these have, are morally controversial. They actually are made up of dead virus. 
Uh, their efficacy ranges from 50 to 91 for Sinovac and Sinopharm is 78%. They can be kept in a regular refrigerator like the refrigerators you find in your home. And so this is one of the advantages of this vaccine uh, in the Philippines. Now in terms of price, so let me just, uh, this is a price list of the vaccines that, well, that was released by Senator Sonia Angara's office. We have learned since then that the government is negotiating specific prices for each vaccine uh, based upon their bilateral uh, agreements with the vaccine companies. What is most important to see though is the, the cheapest vaccine that is currently approved is AstraZeneca. And that was, the, that was the vaccine that was made in the United Kingdom using the fetal cell lines. And uh, I know because uh, Quezon City bought these vaccines and so did Las Piñas at a discount rate of about 500 pesos per Filipino. Um, Moderna and Sinovac. So we have been told by Senator, by Secretary Galvez that the Sinovac vaccine, even though the list price is 3,600 pesos, the Philippine government was able to purchase it for around 600, between 600 and 700 pesos per person. Now, I, I point this out because what became very clear during the negotiations for these vaccines over the last uh, month or so is that the poorest Filipinos will be receiving vaccines, uh, pri primarily AstraZeneca, um, that were created using the fetal cell lines. We also expect that the, Filip the poorest Filipino will receive uh, Sinovac and, and Sinopharm and probably Gamalaya as well from Russia. Let me explain why. Uh, by this final part, the COVID-19 vaccines, when will they arrive in our country? So the first thing you have to realize is that in 2021, there will be a significant shortage of vaccines uh, produced in the West. So there are 7.8 billion people living uh, on the planet at this time. Uh, given the best manufacturing capacity of all the Western vaccines, not including the vaccines from China, uh, we will only be able to produce about 5.6 uh, for doses for 5.6 billion people. That means 2.2 billion people still will not have the ability to receive vaccines. And this is why the Chinese vaccines play such an important role in fulfilling global supply. You will see that the majority of the vaccines were bought by five groups the United States, the European Union, England, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. Just these five um, groupings were able to purchase 80% of all the vaccines that the West will produce. What this means is that there are only 800 million Western vaccines available for the rest of the world. This is why you will see, if you see in the news, why the Philippines is focusing on Chinese vaccines. So there's a lot of people going, why are the Philippine, Philippine government focusing on Russian and Chinese vaccines? It is because of this. There are not enough Western vaccines to cover the entire planet. So most of the developing countries, most of the resource poor countries, have had to reach out to China and to Russia in order to buy our vaccines. Now, in terms of possible deployment, we expect the first batch of vaccines to arrive in the Philippines next month in February. Uh, this will come from the World Health Organization. This is the COVAX facility. There will, this will be primarily Western vaccines it will allow us to vaccinate about 3% of the Filipino population, which will cover first and foremost, the medical frontliners because they are most at risk. We then expect the majority of the vaccines to begin arriving 
at the earliest around June, probably in July. So June, July, until December, we expect most of the vaccines to arrive by then. Now, the Philippines has categorized priority lists in the following way. So I will, so the World Health Organization provided a list, a priority list, and the Philippine government has also complied with that list. list. So first priority will go to frontline health workers. This is justified morally because they have the highest risk of contact of, of clinical exposure to COVID-19. And if our, our frontline health workers are sick, they are not able to provide care for everyone else. So this is about 0.57% uh, of the Philippine population. The second priority is senior citizens. And the national government has prioritized within that group, the indigent senior citizens first. So in Quezon City and in Las Piñas, currently these two LGUs are conducting a uh, census to identify all the senior citizens, especially the, the poorest senior citizens. You have to know that this is unlike any other country in the entire world. So most other countries will prioritize senior citizens, but not the poorest first. The third priority in the, uh, in the national government scheme is all of the other poor. So the remaining indigent population, another 12%. Again, this is unprecedented in the entire world. And this is actually, uh, the, the national government has justified this. And this would be supported by Catholic, so, uh, Catholic social teaching that the poorest of the poor are most vulnerable and most at risk for the long-term detrimental effects of the pandemic. And the fourth priority is essential workers and outside health, um, he health individuals um, and education. And um, what is interesting is an argument can be made that our priests will fall on the fourth priority because of their high exposure to large groups of people. Now to conclude my presentation before I open to questions, I just want to highlight the challenge, the enormous challenge of this vaccination. Um, it will be the largest and most complicated public health effort in the history of our country. It will especially benefit the poor and most vulnerable amongst us. To give you a sense of what must be done we have to vaccinate at least 75 million people to end the pandemic in the Philippines. This is every single Filipino adult. And the reason why is because the Filipinos, the Philippines is a relatively young country. So 30 to 35% of Filipinos are 17 years or younger and the vaccines are not approved for them. So in order to vaccinate the 70% of the population that we need to end the pandemic, we have to vaccinate basically every Filipino. Every Filipino adult has to be vaccinated. The, the particular logistical challenge is we will have to vaccinate most of them twice within a month. I can tell you already that the LGUs where I, uh, in, uh, where I consult, this is the largest challenge. How do you convince Lolo and Lola who live in a slum to come back to the hospital or to come back to the vaccination center 28 days after they were vaccinated? So most Filipinos believe that when they are vaccinated once, tapos na. But for this particular COVID-19, they must be vaccinated twice. So we have to, we have to vaccinate them once, send them home, and then we have to find them 28 days later and bring them back. And then we have to vaccinate the second batch while we are still vaccinating the first batch. And then we have four or five or six different vaccines and we have to vaccinate the first, the, the person with the same vaccine. So one of the things that we are developing now is the data capacity 
to keep track of the 75 million Filipinos that will have to be vaccinated. And the particular challenge is I have been involved in trying to understand vaccine hesitancy. We were able to deploy a survey around the country. We now have 10,000 responses. And 40% of Filipinos say that they are not sure if they will be vaccinated. If we do not vaccinate 40% of the adults, the pandemic will not end. We will continue to have a pandemic every single year. We will have lockdowns every three months in order to keep this under control. This is why it is such a difficult logistical problem. And it's such a critical problem for our country. And so uh, I would like to make two requests to you excellencies. First, I humbly ask that the bishops of the Philippines uh, consider adding the intention to the Orazio Imperata that we are already praying for um, to beg God to bless our efforts to end the pandemic. And second, and this is what I know because I, I, I talk to the poorest people, they are scared. And so they are so scared to be vaccinated. And it breaks my heart because they are the most vulnerable ones, the oldest ones, the poorest ones, and they are terrified. And so I ask that the bishops of the Philippines that you consider being vaccinated on TV alongside the mayors of your LGUs because we are trying, you know, so at UST, we are trying to, uh, we have started a campaign, a public awareness campaign to help the Filipinos to understand vaccines. But one of the things we have discovered is that science is not enough. They do not trust science but they trust their bishops. And so it's most important that the church uh, help the country to fight this pandemic. Otherwise it will not end. This is, this is the challenge we have. If 40% of the Filipinos do not vaccinate, we will not be able to end this pandemic and they will have to be vaccinated every year in order to keep this, this, this pandemic at bay. So you can imagine, you know, I have been working on this for eight months now and the last two months on the vaccines. And it is so heartbreaking to, to talk to Filipinos who are terrified about the vaccines, but it's so important for them to, to be vaccinated. So um, thank you so much. I'll be open to questions. Thank, thank you, Father. Uh, I Hands raised uh, for questions. Let us not waste time. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, Bernie, please help me. Uh, I see Bishop Pabilio. Bishop Pabilio. Father, Bishop thank you. Leon. Uh, Bishop Mercado. Uh, uh, Father, okay. thank you very much for your beautiful and orderly presentation. Uh, I'd like to know about the efficacy of the vaccine. How long will it stay? You have mentioned that you have to be vaccinated every year because of this. So, Excellency, uh, the coronavirus, we do not know how long these vaccines will be effective for because it's been so short of a time. The data right now shows they're at least effective for eight months, but that's only as long as we've had them for. Uh, second thing is, based on our experience with the other coronaviruses. So there are other coronaviruses uh, that cause the common cold. Uh, the immune system only defends against those common coronaviruses for about a year, which is why we expect the same thing to happen with COVID-19. Uh, and the expectation therefore is that the Filipinos will have to be vaccinated at least once a year or maybe every two years. And then how? And then uh, who will pay for these vaccines? Will the government is, or what? So that is a wonderful question, Excellency. Uh, no one knows the answer to that question. So at this time, uh, the vaccine manufacturers are selling their vaccines at cost to end the pandemic. 
but the agreement is that after the pandemic is ended, they will be able to sell their vaccines. One of the reasons why I am back in the United States for one month is to try to develop a yeast-based vaccine for the Philippines that will be cheap and effective uh, and will be able to store and transport it without, free, without uh, refrigeration. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop uh, De Leon, Francis. Bishop can De you Leon. hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. We can. Okay. Uh, I read, uh, Father, that uh, Johnson & Johnson is developing vaccine that can be uh, used only once. So instead of two doses, only once. Is that true? So J Johnson & Johnson Janssen's vaccine the clinical trial data is expected to be released next week, Excellency. Uh, if it is uh, efficacious, if it is effective, we will know about it. Um, and yes, the advantage of that vaccine is that it would be required only, one, you would only need one dose of that vaccine rather than two. However, supplies of that vaccine will also be severely limited this year. So we expect that it will probably be part of the vaccine portfolio of the Philippines, but it will, there will not be enough doses for the first year, maybe the second or third year when they ramp up production, we will be able to use that more frequently. But for now, most of the vaccines that are available require two doses. Thank you. Bish Last Bishop. one, ah. is this, is this oh, a suggestion? One. Since many people now are going to Sunday masses, we can use the church and the occasion to have them vaccinated because next Sunday or two Sundays after, they will go again to mass. That so is a wonderful, in fact, Excellency, I am aware from talking to Mayor Joy Belmonte that the Diocese of Nova Liches has volunteered the parishes uh, in uh, Quezon City for vaccination sites. And there are, there are particular demands for a vaccination site, but as I explained to, to the Mayora two days ago, it is an excellent idea because right now the Filipinos are terrified about going to hospitals to get their vaccines because they are worried they will get COVID while they're being vaccinated. And so uh, a church for Filipinos is a safe place and so hopefully there will be parishes with large parking lots or large halls that are ventilated well that will be able to be converted into a vaccine, a vaccination center. So I urge the bishops to contact your mayor or your mayora. The LGU, the vaccine deployment program for our country is being run primarily at the LGU level. So it is the LGUs that have the responsibility of identifying places and people to be vaccinated. So I encourage, and I will actually, you know, when I work with the national government, I will encourage the national government to reach out to the church, to the bishops. So this will be a collaboration between the church and the, and the state because it is so essential for the well-being of our country, especially for the poor. Bishop Mercado, Cortez, uh, and Villegas. Bishop Mercado, Cortez, and Milo. Milo. Bishop Jesse, are you connected? Can I be heard now? Yeah, yes, yes. All right. Uh, I thank you, Father, for that wonderful, very informative uh, sharing. My, my f First, the experience is not even all of us bishops are really 100% convinced that we should have uh, ourselves vaccinated because sometimes, because of the fear of the side effect, do you have some kind of a side effect that may also uh, produce a negative effect for, to your health? And that is one thing that we, we need to be you know, clarified on. No side effect by ito, or completely, or uh, therefore, we should all take it, no questions asked. Yun lang, yun lang gusto tanongin. Thank you, Excellency. So I found out this morning that I will be vaccinated on Friday. 
here in the United States because my home state of Rhode Island requires everyone living with the elderly and we have elderly priests in our community. So we are now required to be vaccinated on Friday. Uh, we do, yes, Excellency, there will be side effects. So we know of those side effects. Uh, for a 24 hour to 48 hour period, you, will, you might have fever, you might have uh, exhaustion, you will stay in bed, your arm will probably be painful, but it will last only 24 to 48 hours. And the reason is because after 48 hours, the vaccine has actually been removed from your body. So the idea is that you, we inject it with you and then it will init, trigger a response and it will be removed. There is also a very rare chance of allergic response. So uh, for the Moderna vaccine, there were, I believe, there were something like 20 people out of 4 million vaccinated. And uh, these are people who have a history of allergies, severe allergies. So if you have a severe allergy, allergy excellency, then you should speak to your doctor to, to check that. But we have, for those people who have extreme allergic reactions, they usually walk around with what is called an EpiPen. So if they eat uh, a peanut or something, they will immediately inject themselves with uh, the with the um, with epinephrine to prevent the the allergic shock. So one of the things that will happen in the Philippines is that every vaccination point is going to have that epipen that will allow us to respond to you if you have a rare allergic rea reaction. And it usually happens within 15 minutes, which is why the protocol is that you will be uh, vaccinated. And then you have to stay in the vaccination site for 15 minutes while they watch you to see if you have an allergic response. So yes, there will be, there will be, um, you will feel like you have to stay at home and you will probably be in bed. You will feel like you have a little flu for two days. But as one person told me who was already vaccinated, it is better than being on a respirator. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bishop Cortez, next. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Father, for enlightening me because uh, I was hesitating from the many uh, texts, internet, survival, vibers that I received. They always say the best prevention is increase your immunity and they specify all the things that increases our immunity and all that decreases, okay? But just to share with what you have uh, informed us, I have a brother doctor in the States. His son is a doctor. I have a sister who is a nurse, who is a frontliner in the States. So my brother and my brother and his wife received all these uh, vaccines because as senior citizens and American citizens, they have the rights and they have even the money. For my brother and sister-in-law, there was no problem. Meaning to say, after one week, they say only one week, they got the second shot. Is that true? Anyway, there, 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 there is no vaccine for that, so it's probably three, Excellency. Okay, okay. But what I'm interested in is my sister, who is a nurse and a frontliner. He received, she received the, the vaccine. And all the symptoms that you were saying, she got fever, she got uh, breathing problem. She got pains in, his, in her body. What is beautiful is my brother doctor assured her, Kitang, that's part of the game. Talagang ganyan. No? And then after a week, I received a viber from, from my brother doctor. Kitang is well and back to work. So what I'm trying to say is thank you for enlightening me. And 
Thank you for giving us the true warning and giving us the means how to prevent this pandemic. It has to be all Filipinos or otherwise we cannot control. Thank you very much, Father. And I will okay. do my best to convince my people. Thank, Thank you. you. Bishop, we have Bishop Milo and Bishop Ambo afterwards. Abel is also. Bill Yegas also. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 Father, thank you for the presentation. Um, just a query because uh, first, uh, um, there have been talks like getting the, like you presented it well, getting the vaccines from China. No, It's like politicized also, something like that. No, And uh, um, because of what you presented in terms of percentage, no, has a, like... Uh, uh, it's acceptable, but has a lower percentage compared to the to the other uh, uh, vaccine producers in the West. No, so uh, and uh, I think it's 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 quite clear here that uh, uh, perhaps government is trying to look at China because also of the situation of the population we have and the supply. No, so. Uh, in terms of your immersion also, given local government units and the national level, uh, is it really politicized? Is there, is there a problem and it will be a, 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 a situation also where there will be you know, corruption? I, this is one question I'd like to ask. So um, you've asked multiple questions, so I will, I will answer them in order. So the first thing about the 50% efficacy, you have to understand that the goal of the vaccination program is not to prevent COVID-19. People are shocked by that. It is to prevent severe COVID-19 that will kill you. So even if you have a 50% efficacious vaccine, what that means is if you got COVID-19, you will have a bad cold instead of going to the hospital. No one, you know, so, so I tell people, if we can vaccinate some people with 95%, some people with 50%, probably 70%, what we are doing is we're giving the Filipino people enough immunity so that no one will die and no one will go to the hospital. So that will end the pandemic. Even if some people get COVID-19, if none of them get sick enough to go to the hospital, if you are just staying at home because you have a bad cold or a flu for two days, then it's okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing with, um, with corruption, uh, I will answer first as a priest. And so Excellency, as you know, as a priest yourself, uh, there is people are trying to make money out of this left, right, and center. And but from the people I work with are doing their best to avoid um, to avoid the corruption. One of the things, one of the things most people are worried about are actually fake vaccines. And so what we are trying to do while we set up this vaccine procurement and deployment program is we have to make sure that we destroy all the vials of the vaccine after the vaccines have been used because we are worried that the black market will take them and use them. Mm -hmm. So, and third, with regards to China, I think that, that one of the things that you have to realize is the reason why so many, why the government is trying to buy from China and from, from Russia is because there's not enough. So we have to buy from as many people as possible. And yet our survey has shown that because of the controversy over the Chinese vaccines, 90% of Filipinos are very hesitant about the Chinese vaccines. They are not confident about them at all. And so this will be a particular challenge uh, for the national government, for all of us to try to help our Kababayans understand everything that is true about the Chinese vaccines. Thank you. First, Bishop. Bishop Ambo, first. Yeah, and then Bishop Sok. Bishop Abel. Archbishop Nauna, si Archbishop Sok. Uh, okay, Archbishop Sok, please. Uh, sorry, sorry. Brother Nick. Hello, Archbishop. Hey. It's nice to see you, Archbishop. 
<laughs> uh, can you explain the phase one, phase two, phase three trials? And then which of the vaccines have undergone which phase? So in order to uh, have a vaccine, in fact, any drug, the drug or the vaccine has to pass through different stages. The first stage is called preclinical trials where the vaccine or the drug is tested in animals. The second uh, stage, which is called phase one clinical trial is a safety trial. What happens here is we invite uh, maybe 30 healthy volunteers to be vaccinated. We want to see whether or not the vaccine makes them sick. The phase two clinical trial has to do with dosing. How much do you have to vaccinate someone with? Now, for many of these vaccines, they combine the phase one, phase two clinical trial. So what they did is they invited healthy volunteers and they increased the size of the number of healthy volunteers and they gave different amounts to each group to look at the safety and the efficacy. You see that's called a phase two clinical trial. The phase three clinical trial is, involves usually uh, tens of thousands of people. It must be done in a community setting where the risk of getting sick is high. So for example, um, I know that clinical trials have begun here in the Philippines and some of our um, most affected barangays. So what will happen is they will inoculate maybe 2,000 people living in a barangay, 1,000 with placebo, 1,000 with vaccine. And then they ask, how many of these people will get sick with COVID-19 just walking around? And then they count what percentage of those people were vaccinated. That's how we calculate the 95% efficacy. And so all of the approved vaccines have passed through phase one, phase two, and phase three. And uh, what you, what, one of the advantages of, being, um, of having a delayed vaccine trial, vaccination campaign in the Philippines is we are learning from the vaccination campaigns elsewhere in the world. So right now, that's why I can tell you, you know, after millions of Americans and millions of Europeans, we have a better sense of the side effects. We have better sense of the allergic response because now millions of people are being vaccinated. Thank you. Now, Bishop Ambo and Bishop Apigo. Uh, thank you very much, Father Nick. I am Bishop Ambo David of the Diocese of Caloocan. Um, uh, Thank you for changing my attitude towards the other vaccines like the, the Chinese and the Russian vaccines. I realized that uh, the issues about them are really more political than scientific. Um, with regard to our situation in the diocese, uh, I have had a meeting already with the local government unit and I was informed that they have uh, already uh, ordered uh, from AstraZeneca. A while ago, you identified which AstraZeneca. Which LGU, Excellency, which LGU did you speak with? Diocese of Caloocan. Uh, uh, LGU of Caloocan, Caloocan City. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. And um, so you mentioned that uh, AstraZeneca is uh, one of the vaccines that uh, used the uh, fetal cell lines. No? But I followed your uh, own uh, reflection uh, and uh, the moral theological aspect of it, uh, uh, do I understand you right that um, even those that used fetal cell lines are not necessarily morally compromised, strictly speaking, uh, because they did not really abort them for this purpose, but they used dead uh, fetal uh, cell lines. It's as good as asking the question, because you asked the question, may a virtuous tourist use a Roman road that was constructed by slaves 2000 years ago? You know, you can reformulate the question and say, may a virtuous doctor use a cadaver of a murdered person without being considered as an accomplice in the murder of that person, you know? Uh, yes. that, that, that enlightened me, your uh, moral theological question. So in a sense, we're not morally theologically 
compromised if we open to AstraZeneca. That's correct, Excellency. But Thank one of the things that one of the things because of social media, what you will discover is that people have a heightened sensitivity to some of these questions. So even though uh, in principle, they, do, they, you know, they are not morally compromising themselves or endangering their salvation. What you will see is that, especially here in the United States, some Catholics simply do not wish to be associated with abortion in any way. And I deeply understand their convictions. Now, what, what the difference is that here in the United States, um, people are able to wait and people are able to buy their own vaccines because the United States has, is ahead of the line and is basically hoarding all the vaccines it possibly can. So, but in the Philippines, the particular challenge we have is that because of the severe limitations in supply, it is unlikely that the Filipino people will be able to wait. Um, they, if they waited, they would wait for many years uh, or, and delay the, the end of the pandemic. And then it would be, the pricing would be such that it would be difficult for most of the Filipinos, especially those who are poor, to avail themselves of the, of the alternative vaccines. Which is why I, I, I just wanted to give you an honest assessment of, in a sense, not only the morals, but just the prudential circumstances of the choices that our people are going to make in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you and thank you very much. We have Bishop Apigo. Bishop Abel Apigo of uh, the South, uh, Father Nick. Good morning. Good morning in, your in your presentation, uh, Father Nick, uh, towards the end, you were asking us or you were campaigning for support since in your, in your discourse, you made mention that people trust more the bishops, their shepherds along this uh, area. And so uh, in your presentation, you also said that the government is targeting the month of February as the beginning of this uh, vaccination, the first wave of the vaccination. So along this line, may I uh, ask you or your permission because many of us are enlightened with your with your discourse this morning and much more our priests also need uh, this uh, this enlightenment so can i or can we ask your this uh, section since this is recorded to ask your presentation so that we will use this in our presbyterium meeting or our <coughs> recollection this month so that most of the priests are also enlightened and in this manner we can uh, right away or we can convince more people to support us because you being an expert along this area is uh, really, really uh, something that uh, we really uh, have to uh, believe. So that's uh, my first point. And then second also the consideration of okay, changing a little bit on our Ratio Imperata to uh, ask God to uh, enlighten the people on this, uh, the, the good side of this uh, vaccination. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. Bishop Florencio. Mm -hmm. Florencio. Uh, ah, before, uh, before uh, Bishop Oscar, already the Secretariat is prepared to, to have this special session uh, ready for, for use. If, okay, okay. Did I hear it correctly that Father would allow it? Yes, uh, Okay, so. Thank you. The, uh, Father Bernie, uh, Mr. Bernie has already uh, 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 foreseen that possibility, so it's it's good. Um, second, before we forget, the uh, Commission on Liturgy, uh, Bishop Vic, that consideration to add uh, to our prayer uh, a special line uh, coming from uh, our uh, resource person, uh, Bishop Vic. Yes, uh, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. I noted that's, that's that noted. Uh, and then you can circulate the prayer again to, uh, to us, a new, a new text, uh, okay, in this yeah. time of uh, vaccination. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Bishop Oscar. Thank you, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Muloy. Thank you, Father uh, Nick Anor, Father Nick. Um, uh, I have this uh, question. One, um, they say that normally vaccines will have to take uh, more years to uh, manufacture, to be tested, uh, and all these things, more or less around five years or even more. 
Now, with these vaccines that we have, or those vaccines that have been manufactured both in Europe and in the uh, United Kingdom, they seem to be less than, even less than a year. Okay, that's number one. How true is this, that vaccines are to be manufactured and has to be tested um, more or less uh, with a, a length of time? Second, there is uh, one of the fears which you, Father Nick, has also um, uh, agreed that one of the fears that we have um, with the people that we have is this, that uh, in these uh, manufacturers of the vaccines, some of the uh, negative effects are not being uh, publicized. How true is this? Because I've been hearing among uh, some of my people that uh, there is these uh, things that are being hidden um, uh, of these uh, manufacturers. They are not uh, revealed or they are not uh, um, uh, being publicized. The third one is this. Um, I was uh, in communication with a businessman from India and uh, he was uh, of the thought that uh, you know, some of these uh, vaccines that we have are European, um, United Kingdom, or wherever. No, um, he said um, India is more or less, or together with China, is more or less um, having the context of Asian, or with the same uh, you know um, uh, context that we have. No? Um, uh, India is a poor uh, country, but uh, he has uh, it has also manufacturers. Um, uh, I don't know if this is correct, if he says that uh, if we are to be vaccinated, then we are to be vaccinated with an Asian um, uh, manufacturers because they have an Asian mind when they manufacture this. I mean, the, even, even with the uh, ingredients, so to speak, with these uh, vaccines. Thank you very much, uh, Father. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, to answer your first question, it is not about time but money. So the reason why it usually takes years to make vaccines is because money is limited. Uh, this, because of the pandemic, Excellency, money was unlimited. Billions of dollars and euros were being thrown at scientists in order to generate this vaccine, the first thing. The second reason why vaccines usually take time, Excellency, is you need, as I explained to Bishop Sock, you have to wait to watch you have to do a clinical trial that exposes people that where people are exposed to the infection. Most infections, uh, for example, Ebola, are very rare. So it's very hard to finish your clinical trial in a short period of time because there are few, so few people who have Ebola. But here, as of yesterday, 100 million people around the world have been uh, sick with COVID-19. So it was so easy. All they had to go to was Brazil. And within a few weeks, so many people were getting sick that they accelerated the time of infection. So that's why it's take, it took the shorter period of time does not mean that it was shortcuts were taken. Uh, what it means is that with unlimited money and with a global pandemic, you can do a lot of things. Uh, with regards to the, um, the, un the hidden data, um, especially here in the United States, that is a common story. It's a conspiracy that the big pharma is trying to reprogram people. There is data of dying patients that were not included. Uh, of course, you know, we do not know what we do not know, but the, the data that was published by Moderna and Pfizer um, are complete. They involve numerous countries. So if you, so, so you have to, in order to, to gauge the, the truth of the claim, you have to say that people from all over the world, not affiliated with the company. So people, regulators of different countries had to be a part of the conspiracy to hide the data. And so that's much less, I'm much less willing to do that. And finally, with the Indian uh, concern. So India, uh, there are two vaccines being produced in India. One is Novavax. And Novavax is an American vaccine that will be manufactured in India. 
And uh, the Philippines has already made uh, an advanced purchase agreement for, I believe, 20 million of these, uh, even though Novavax has not yet published its clinical trials. Now, India has made its own vaccines, but unfortunately, India has not released its phase three clinical trials. So, uh, you know, we, I, I don't know if it's safe. I don't know if it works. So even though it was made in Asia, we don't know anything about it. So uh, that's the reason why you will notice the Philippine government has not yet um, indicated any interest in that Indian made vaccine because the science has not yet been completed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you excellent. Any okay. other hand? Uh, yeah. Bernie? Is a Pabilio? Uh, yeah, Pabilio. Is a Pabilio? Okay. okay. And just like uh, 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 Father Nick, can you please tell us more about herd immunity? <laughs> no. And then uh, with this, what about the children who are not to be vaccinated? Is it because of herd immunity that they need not be vaccinated? And together with this, once we get vaccinated, do we still have to use mask? Do you still have to have uh, physical distancing when you are vaccinated? So okay. I will start with the, with the last question first. It will take about one month after the second dose before you are completely vaccinated. So what that means is that if you are vaccinated, <laughs> you are actually still vulnerable for about two months because it takes your body two months, uh, two doses and two months to completely uh, protect itself. Now, in terms of herd immunity, herd immunity is the following. Um, not everyone can be vaccinated in a country because there are some people who will be allergic to the vaccine. There will be some people who simply cannot be vaccinated for one reason or another. Uh, when this happens, we rely on herd immunity. What this means is the following. With this, with this COVID-19, 170%, so 170% of the population is vaccinated. The virus cannot infect someone who is not vaccinated because it cannot find that person. So if you, if you understand now, the re, so in Mountain Province, we are the B117 variant that was identified three days ago or four days ago. One of the reasons why that can spread is because one person can talk to another person and they can spread that virus. But if I am sick and there is herd immunity, 70% of the people around me have been vaccinated. So the probability that I will vaccinate, uh, I will infect someone is practically zero. So there's no way for the virus to get from me through the herd to the 30% who are not vaccinated. It just, and, and I will just, it, the group protects the vulnerable. Now with regards to children and infants, and there was also a question uh, on the chat room, the chat box. It is not that children will not be vaccinated. It is that the clinical trials that have been completed were not done with children. So we cannot approve the vaccines for children yet. Yesterday, Moderna announced that they have fully um, they have begun another clinical trial with children that we expect the results by the end of this year. Depending upon those results, the vaccine may or may not be approved to inoculate our children. Hopefully though, if the 70% of the adult, all the adults are inoculated, that will destroy the pandemic in our country so our children will not get sick because there's no more virus around. Okay, thank you. Uh, time check, it's past 12. Two more, two more, please. And, and that is Archbishop Bridesma and uh, Father Mar Bishop Marvin from my point here. Archbishop Bridesma, please. Yes, thank you, Father, for the enlightening presentation. 
May I just ask about the prioritization of the indigent, indigent population? Does it have to be all the poor or can it be subdivided into the indigent population in densely populated areas like cities? But in the rural areas, we observe here in our area, Northern Mitena, that there are very few cases of COVID in the remote areas because also of uh, social distancing. So they, they may not need to be prioritized uh, in the scheme of implementation. Thank you, Excellency. So you actually brought up a question that I did not have the time to address in my presentation. There is also a geographical priority in the, in the vaccination scheme uh, based upon number of cases in the region. So for example, we expect that the NCR and region 4A will be prioritized in the um, vaccination scheme. So, uh, and the idea is that the 62% of the pandemic is isolated in those two regions of the country. So if you, if you add the NCR and, and region 4A, Calabarzon, 60% of the pandemic is in that air region, these two regions. So one of the strategies is to try to, if you think of it as a snake, the NCR and region 4A is the head of the snake. So we can cut off the head and we hopefully will be able to significantly diminish the pandemic in the country simply by removing the head of the pandemic. So uh, for example, next month when the COVAX vaccines arrive and when we also get the Moderna vaccine. So the, the Philippines has secured 20 million doses of the Moderna vaccines. If you remember the Moderna vaccine requires very cold temperatures, minus 20. I, I, I believe though it has not been confirmed that those vaccines will be focused in on the NCR in region 4A and maybe region three so that we will vaccinate primarily the, the heart of the pandemic so that your uh, diocese excellency, uh, if you know, after 14 days, if the, the virus will die so if we, see, if we isolate your diocese in northern Mindanao uh, for 14 days, all the viruses will be killed. And hopefully, if we are able to do that in Manila, then the travelers from Manila and those who will bring the virus to your diocese will not be able to bring any virus anymore. So there's going to be a geographic priority as well. Um, I didn't have a chance to, to, to discuss that, primarily because the decisions with regard to the prioritization of the regions will depend upon what the pandemic looks like when the vaccines start to arrive uh, in larger quantities. So in the middle of the year, depending upon um, which regions have the most cases, that will be prioritized first. But you. so your, 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 your diocese excellency may not even receive any vaccines for a while because there are such low numbers in your diocese. Thanks be to God. Okay. Bishop you. Molloy. And, and last, uh, yeah. Bishop, Bishop Marvin. Oh. Marvin. Oh. Oh. Bishop Molloy. Ah. Thank you. Next, next na lang, Bishop Bakay, you'll be the last. Oh, okay. Marvin, oh. uh, be conscious of the time. Uh, we are past 12. Opo. Thank you for Archbishop. Uh, thank you for Father Nick for the beautiful presentation. Uh, I am Bishop Marvin from Antique. Ang tanong ko lang po, you mentioned a while ago in your presentation that you're trying to develop a, a locally based, a yeast based na vaccine, which if developed, hopefully would really be of help uh, to us. Ang tanong ko lang po, Father Nick, how are you doing with the, with the experiment uh, dun po sa ginagawa ninyo? So we, we are in preclinical uh, trials right now. So I am in the United States to finish the, the engineering of the yeast. And then I will return to the Philippines at the end of February or the beginning of March. And we, we have already set up a laboratory, it's a UST. We mm -hmm. will test our vaccine with animals. And if it passes the preclinical trial, our hope is to approach the, the, the national government to uh, ask for volunteers in the Filipino population to test this because you have to understand uh, the cost of this, if our vaccine works, and I have a vow of poverty, so I'm not really looking for money, 
So people are saying, hey, how much will it cost? I said, I'm willing to give it for free. I have a vow of poverty. So um, it will cost to produce probably five pesos per person. Oh. That, that, because what we will do is we will go, there are yeast factories already in Laguna. So we will just ask them to grow the yeast that I am making in my laboratory. And then the, you, what, what you do is you add the yeast to your milk. So you add mm -hmm. it to milk and you drink it every day for seven days. And the idea would be that you would then develop enough immunity uh, to prevent you from getting COVID-19 severely. You may still get COVID-19, but it, may, it will become a cold rather than a severe illness. And if this is the case, we can just mail these packets of yeast to the 7,000 islands. You know, the, the Dominicans, uh, we have the pastoral care of two islands in the Babuyanes, uh, Calayan and Camiguin. And so my brothers at the convent of Santo, um, convent of, in Santo Tomas are always saying, how do we get the vaccines to Camiguin, to, to, to Cagayan, to the northern islands of, and it's very difficult if we have to keep them in the refrigeration because they require a six to seven hour crossing to the islands. So this is why I decided to, to try to develop this vaccine. So Excellency, we, I, I told Our Lady, I will do the best science I can do but she has to take care of it. Thank you. We will pray for the success of the experiment, uh, Father Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Archbishop Bakay. What the last? Yeah, thank you, Father Nick. Uh, this is Archbishop uh, Bakay. Thank you for the help that you extended, not only now, but even uh, before when we work together. But I'd like to uh, say that there are many bishops now and even lay who would like to get your number, the one I got from Father Pablo Chong to contact you for this. Is it okay to give that so that they can get in touch with you or us even after this, especially that you will still be in the stage for next month? Yes, I can, I can uh, provide you with my email address. So any of the bishops, if you wish to contact me, we can Zoom because... Um, you know, it's it's midnight here in the States, but my, I am jet lagged at the moment. So midnight is not a problem at all. And um, I teach on two sides of the planet. So my time schedule is completely changed. So yes, you can share my contact information with the bishops if they wish. Um, now uh, there's a, yes, Archbishop. Name of, uh, in the name of the Office of Bioethics, thank you so much for the help. You're welcome, Archbishop. And I hope to return to Cagayan one day. Huh? I would like sure. to go back to the law. Yes, the seat of Nueva Segovia before. So, last time, Bishop. Bishop, last time. Uh, make it quick, uh, oh, yes. Marquez. Yeah. Uh, Nick, what can you say about the virgin coconut oil used as COVID prevention? So, Excellency, I know that there are scientists in the Philippines who are testing that possibility, but there is no evidence at this time to support that claim. Thank, thank you. Uh, Father Nick, in the name of the bishops of the conference, I'm very sure that they agree with me that it is a very enlightening, very educative presentation. We really uh, have gratitude in our hearts for your presence uh, for all of us. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Excellencies. Yeah, yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. And can we pray? Uh, just uh, uh, offer one prayer to our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, Lord is speaking. with you. Blessed are you among, among women. women. And blessed, and blessed, is, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners. sinners. Now, now at the hour of our death. Our death. Our death. Amen. 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 Mary, Queen of Apostles, pray, pray, for us. pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In your lunch, and at 2.30, we will begin our afternoon session. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice presentation. It is from Austria.
Okay, I will end this meeting for all, ha? Huh? Ano?